Good morning. I invite you to stand as we begin our service together with all your people sing. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. 
The guards shook with fear, and when they saw him, they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women, Don't be afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said it would happen. Come and see where his body was lying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. He is alive. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And my friends, Christ is here with us this morning. He is alive. Welcome to Morrow Gospel Church here in Winnipeg. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us here this beautiful Sunday morning. It's an exciting day. It's Easter Sunday, and we're celebrating our risen Savior. But our celebration doesn't stop there. Our friend and our sister Virginia Lucier is going to be baptized as part of our celebration this morning. And Pastor Paul will be sharing the message a little later. So for those of you who brought plants and flowers to make this beautiful in here this morning, thank you so much. There's all kinds of color all over the place. And so if you, have, if you can't see from where you're sitting, come and take a look a little bit later on. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. And thank you for those of you who came for breakfast. Pam was the one who coordinated everything. Thank you, Pam. She's been doing triple duty this morning. And uh, she, gave, she gave leadership and, uh, to, to get that all put together. And so thank you for those who brought food and to help set up and clean up. And don't forget to pick up your dishes and your containers after the service. Last week, Rob Shipman, our council chairperson, announced that Herb Franz will be joining us as interim part-time lead pastor. His first day will be Tuesday, April the 2nd, and his office hours will be Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Um, and he will also be speaking next Sunday. So if you're interested, there are sheets at the back of the sanctuaries that will give you a little bit more information about Herb, so you can be a little bit more familiar with him. And if you happen to miss when he did his presentation, uh, he actually preached here on October the 1st. So you can go back onto the Moral Gospel Church YouTube channel and you can pick up that sermon if you'd like to hear that sermon. And um, it will uh, just help you become a little bit familiar with Herb. And I just invite you to pray for Herb, that as he steps into this assignment and as he connects with office staff and with you as a congregation, um, that uh, you would just give, pray that he would, uh, it would be a good transition for all of them and that they would be able to work well together. And also for the search committee that they would have much wisdom as they continue their assignment in finding a full-time pastor for our congregation. You'll notice in your bulletin there's a full-page ad or full-page promo for the Blanket Making Ministry fundraiser that comes up on April 14th. Um, there's lots of information about that, and there's a soup and, sa pardon, soup and dessert lunch that will be following the service, and you are all very welcome to join. The funds raised will go towards making hygiene and school kits for Mennonite Central Committee, and also purchasing supplies to continue with the blanket making ministry. Um, the ladies asked if I would give you a little bit more information as to what's happening with the funds. Um, you'll also see that there's something called the Low German Education in Bolivia. Um, Moro Gospel Church is part of the Evangelical Mennonite Mission Conference. And together, um, it's, a, it's a, grouping of, uh, a larger grouping of family of churches, and together we provide partial funding for the ministries in Bolivia. There are currently two schools that are already in operation at uh, Via Nueva and Hacienda Verde, with the third school opening up in just a few weeks, which is very exciting. Ministry among low German-speaking people is expanding, and the people there are very curious to know about the gospel, and they want to know more. A new building has been moved to a new outreach area at Tres Cruces, and Amamense, which means dawn or sunrise in Spanish. I probably butchered that, so I apologize for Spanish-speaking people. That's a new location, and they expect to start classes and a new church in that area very shortly. So your finances and your prayer support for these ministries make a huge difference in the lives of the individuals in the community. And also next Sunday, Steinbach Bible College will be here as part of our morning service. They'll be doing a presentation as well. So uh, next Sunday morning will be a, a full morning of great stuff as well. Let's open in prayer. Gracious God, on this Easter morning of now done darkness, we lift our hearts with praise and we open our lives with joy. We thank you for our Savior, the light of the world, who has brought death to death and life to life. 
We come into your presence with singing, our hearts echoing the chorus of the ages. Hosanna, alleluia forever and ever. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as we continue to sing together, Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. invite the kids to come forward for the next song. We're going to do some actions. I think we got some people who will uh, lead us in the actions as we sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Sing your praise. 
Thank you. May be seated. Good morning. I've never done a baptism on Easter Sunday, but I think it is terribly appropriate. Um, who would agree with that? Most people? <laughs> and something that I couldn't get out of my head uh, this week as we were preparing um, with the baptism and then my sermon was one of the last words that Jesus gave to his disciples were, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to obey all my commandments. And I thought about how Christianity is alive today, not just because we have a living Savior, but also because the early followers, who history has told us, thought they saw a risen Christ, and their lives reflected that truth, that they could not shake them. Um, that public life that they were willing to live for Christ, even if it led to their deaths, I think rippled ahead of time to us being here today even now. So uh, baptism is something that uh, we're called to do when we accept Jesus as our Savior upon grace. And uh, his hope for us is that we live this faith publicly. The broken world, we all would probably say it is. It needs some healing. It needs Jesus. So... Um, Virginia, no pressure, but all of us are supposed to live publicly for Jesus, not just you. Uh, just a reminder for all of us to live in our baptism when we had it. Um, so I'm very thankful, before I call Virginia up, that uh, Pat Fast, who's at the back, who we'll talk a little bit later, um, she agreed to be someone to go through our baptism uh, uh, book, just that's kind of a bit of an essentials book, just to make sure people are well informed before they make this free decision that they want to make to follow Jesus. Um, she met with Pat regularly doing this book, and after they were done, Virginia gave me probably this thick of papers that had her all the questions and all her answers to it. Very thorough. And you would have noticed she also uh, helped on Friday be one of the readers. And I had never heard her read before, but I know how, sh how thorough she is and how her heart is behind her study of the word, and I knew that she would do that well as she prepared, and she did a great job on Friday. Thank you. So you're already getting involved before you're official. Um, so I'm going to welcome her up to come and share her testimony, and then uh, I'm going to run a mic over to Pat to give an affir affirmation on behalf of the congregation afterwards. Never been up here before, but um, I just want to take the time to just thank you all for being so welcoming. And I felt that the second I walked in the door and I knew this was my church and I had been waiting a long, long time uh, studying online. I, I found um, a group uh, through Michael Francis. He was remade and, and uh, became a pastor. And, and we would all meet from people from all over the world. and that just made me want it even more. And um, so I started looking for a church and this was like the fourth one and I thought, oh, I would just like, this has to work and, and it did and here we are. Um, so I was saved at a very young age. Uh, I was six years old and I got bit by a poisonous spider and I was on death's door and um, and I had this fear, this, this just grippling fear. I would pass out and screaming. We tried therapy, we tried everything, and it wasn't working. And my grandmother um, you know, went to my mom and said, listen, do you mind, if, can I tell her about Jesus? Can I share you know, faith? And uh, my mom said, yeah, go ahead, as long as she wants to. And, and then she just planted the seed and then it just, that's how it went, and I was going to Sunday school, and 
And then um, in December 5th, 1991, my father was shot and murdered in cold blood. And um, that just hardened me. It hardened me. Rage and anger. And um, I just, it just changed my life. And um, I lived just in a very bad, bad place and I was going down a road that was just not good. And um, my friend Tanya, she, um, I used to babysit for her. So she said, you know what? I want you to meet my friend Tracy and you can babysit her twin boys. And these sweet little angels, these little babies just softened my heart. And um, it, it proved to me that love can, love can soften the hardest of hearts. And then I started going to church again, and um, I met Chad and Francine Weeb, if they're watching out there on YouTube. Um, and they took me under their wing, and I went to Salvation Army Church. And, and then, uh, surprise, my son came along. I had a little, you know, sinning opportunity there. And, um, but he was the blessing, and um, his dad said to me, kill it or I'm leaving. And um, bye, have a good life, you know. And William, my son, is the best thing that ever happened to me, the best. Uh, life just couldn't get any sweeter and I, I promised I was gonna give him a better life than I ever had. Um, a lot of people don't know, I, I grew up in a very alcoholic, abusive home, a lot of trauma. And um, I, I wasn't going to do that with my son. And, um, and then I met his sister's dad. And um, we were trying. I was engaged. We were trying. And I lost two babies in one year. I lost my six-month-old baby in my belly um, during 9-11. And um, I just decided, OK, you know, I'm slipping again, you know? Um, and then I met my husband later on um, at my job. 14 years later, he decided to ask me out on a date finally. And um, within three months, we were married and, and, and here I am. Um, people ask me when I was saved. I was saved at five, five or six. I knew, I just knew. When you're close to death, um, you know, the last memories I have of being bit was just extreme pain and then passing out. And the last thought I had in my head is I'm never gonna see my mommy again. I'm not gonna see my daddy again. And um, you know, my mom is just the greatest woman that I've ever met in my life. And she was my angel. And matter of fact, I asked my grandmother, I said, grandma is, you know, is, is my mom an angel, you know? And she's, well, she's an angel, but in a different way. And, and um, but I, I, my mom's my hero. And, and so the strength that I get doesn't come from me. It comes from God. And it started at the age of being a toddler. So um, the main message to anybody out there in the YouTube world and on the internet, whoever's here, maybe you're new, um, if you just got to give God a chance. Give him a chance, you know, open that Bible and, and I'm telling you, you won't regret it because inviting him into my life has been the best thing that's ever happened to me. And, um, you know, Sister Pat, um, fantastic, beautiful woman, um, you know, invited me into her home and warmth and love and she believed in me and and uh, I have gotta tell you, when Pastor Paul said, you wanna be baptized on Easter Sunday, and I, I thought Easter Sunday was in the first week of March, but then he said, well, no, he says, you know, and I was like, seven weeks, seven? You want me to wait seven, work with me here, you know? And um, it was a long seven weeks, let me tell you. But it was those Sundays that, you know, when I would come in and would, keep me going and just don't give up, just keep going. And you know, the wolves coming at my door all around me. And um, I, I just kept at it because, you know, I've been waiting over 40 years to be baptized. Yeah. And what a wonderful place to be baptized in. And you're my family. 
and I love you all, and I thank you so very much from the deepest part of my heart. But, you know, Jesus teaches you never give up. You know, on that path when he was walking with his cross, and he would drop his cross, and he would get back up, and he'd keep going. You know, that's, that's what we have to do is help each other carry our crosses every once in a while, you know. But um, I love you all, and thank you for being here, and that's my testimony. <laughs> yes, I am Pat Cass, and I'll that way. Test, 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 yeah. Yes, I'm Path Past, and uh, I wrote out a few sentences on a paper because I had so much to say, I would go on forever. But uh, my, I have felt so privileged that God would give me the assignment of di discipling and preparing Virginia, Virginia for baptism. It has been glorious. Oh, our times of studying the word with her have been absolutely delightful. We wouldn't know how much we laugh and how we rejoice in the word. She loves the word of God. And uh, it, uh, she bought herself a new Bible and just the way she held it, it was like such a treasure. And, uh, and so how, she is a woman, a, a woman of God who's been through much in her life, but God has given her victory in many areas of her life. And I know how she longs to be led by this spirit. She, I believe that she shines like one of God's stars in this dark world. She is also eager to participate in the ministries of the church. If you want someone to work for you, there she is. <laughs> you know? I believe that the Lord will mightily use her here at Morrow and wherever he leads her. Lord, it's, I love you, my dear Virginia, and... Uh, I know we will continue to do work in the Bible together uh, as time goes on. It's such a pleasure and a privilege. Bless you, my dear. Thank you, Pat and Virginia. Um, I know Paul and Virginia and Helen will be getting ready for baptism. And so I invite the ushers to come forward to collect this morning's gifts and offerings. Let's pray together. Father, this morning is a morning of great celebration. We celebrate the risen Christ and that he lives. We praise and we worship you. We praise you for empty tombs. Thank you. For the women and the disciples running with good news. Thank you. For your presence, alive, powerful, and resurrected. Thank you. We celebrate your victory over death, over all the powers that would defeat us. And on this day of great gladness, empower us to be your ambassadors, proclaiming good news. And we celebrate the baptism of Virginia that will be taking place in just a few moments. We pray that you will continue to work in her life and draw her close to you, teaching and encouraging her. And as we welcome her into our congregation shortly, we pray that we will be a gift to each other, encouraging and loving as together we grow in your love and grace. And now in the spirit of worship to the one true God, whether we've given online or give this morning in the offering bag, we offer our tithes and offerings with thankful hearts. And may these gifts be used with an eternal purpose for your kingdom. We leave all this at the feet of Jesus, our risen Savior. Amen. my mind to Calvary where Jesus
Jesus fled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. Romans 10, 9, and 10 say this. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, which we celebrate today, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved.
Virginia. Have you repented of your sin, and do you renounce the evil powers of this world? Yes, I have. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord? You betcha. <laughs> do you accept the word of God as your guide and authority for life? Yes. Do you desire to be received into the fellowship of this church? Amen. Yes, I do. And are you willing to give and receive counsel and participate in the mission of the church with your gifts and abilities? Yes, I do. Yes. Okay. Let me bring you over here. Oops. It's okay. I'm going to turn this way and do the arm thing. There we go. Virginia, upon confession of your faith in Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Look at your church. Toasty <laughs> here. I know, I know. I'd like to invite you to stand. We're going to sing together once more with My Redeemer Lives.
salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. Amen. You can be seated. Please take your Holy Bible or follow uh, the reading up on the overhead. I'm reading this morning uh, from Proverbs chapter 3. It's entitled, Trusting in the Lord. My child, never forget the things that I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn a good reputation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This is the word of the Lord. It is my privilege this morning to welcome Virginia into our membership. Virginia, why don't you come forward? And Rob, if you would come forward as well. This is just a little formality. And so, congregation, I invite you to participate as well. There will be some words up on the overhead in just a moment. Committing to a local church, a local group of Jesus followers, is an an important step in following Jesus. It shows an intent on moving from a fan of Jesus to a follower of Jesus. It shows an intent of wanting to grow as a disciple, receiving encouragement, learning to work together with brothers and sisters in Christ for a common purpose, and a place to practice your gifts, to be held accountable to proper spiritual leadership, to learn and to serve one another, and to be served with Christian support and love. It's Virginia's desire to join Moral Gospel Church as a member today. And as a showing of welcome, Virginia, to our community, would you all stand and participate in the reading that will be up on the overhead? Church family, I'm sorry. Church family, Virginia is presented to you and has witnessed to her faith in Jesus Christ and offers herself as a partner in our obedience to Christ. It is our privilege and joy to welcome her into our family of faith. We, the members of this church, welcome you, Virginia. Joy to our communion and fellowship. We pledge to you our help and our prayers as we solicit yours for us that we may all increase more and more in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ. We want to walk with you in Christian fellowship. We covenant with you to make this church a church of prayer and of union with Christ and with his disciples everywhere in the service of God and man. I'm going to ask Virginia Thiessen to come up and represent church council with us this morning. So Virginia, here's your certificate of baptism. Thank you. And a journal where you can also chart some things. And of course, a hug that welcomes you. (laughs) Oh, You're one of us. (laughs) 
join me in prayer for Virginia as we, uh, as we just take this step with her. Father, this morning we celebrate with Virginia as she has taken the important step of baptism. We ask that you guard her and guide her. We know that struggles and difficulties will come, and we pray that you will remind her that you are her strength and you are her protector. Father, fill her heart with the desire to continue to learn more about you, to know you, and to follow you. Give her freedom and joy to share her faith with those she encounters. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Oh, wasn't that a beautiful baptism ceremony, Virginia? Uh, welcome aboard. <clears throat> yeah. Um, uh, this Easter uh, morning, the sun is shining just like it should be. Uh, you're all here and in good spirits. Uh, hallelujah, he has risen. Uh, it's, I, I love to see that poster up there. I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I, my eyes keep going to it. The scripture that Paul evidently has chosen for his sermon today is in, in Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm going to be reading the first 10 verses, if you want to follow with me. It's entitled, Made Alive with Christ. Once you were dead, doomed forever because of your many sins. You used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passions and desires of our evil nature. We were born with an evil nature, and we were, you, we were under God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even while we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's special favor, special favor, I say, that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and we are seated with him in the heavenly realms, all because we are one with Christ Jesus. And so God can always point to us as examples of the incredible wealth of his favor and kindness towards us, as shown in all he has done for us through Christ Jesus. God saved you by his special favor when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. These are the words of the Lord. As I get set up here, <clears throat> Laurel, do you want to go get the kids and bring them over here? And I invite any of my Sunday school class to also come towards the front, because the young ones might need a little bit of help with what I'm going to do. Oh, just there is good. Yeah, anywhere in the front is good. Who thinks they're going to run in? I, I think so too. I hope the kids are going to run, run up here. Let's see how fast they can run. There we go.
Kids, I interrupted your children's church because us older people need some help. I need you to look up at the front, at, at the screen, actually. Can you look at, at the screen, the picture up there? Yeah. Okay. Empty. No. Yeah, who can read that? Empty. Empty? So what was the tomb on Sunday morning? Empty. Empty? Sunday. 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 Okay, that says empty. I'm going to test your spelling today. So you think that says empty? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay, Aaron, go to the next slide. What does it say? What does it spell now? Are you sure? It's, it's spelled different, though. Empty. Empty, still? Okay, I'll trust you. Aaron, can you go to the next one? What about now? Empty. What? Are you kidding me? But you're taking letters away. The tomb is still empty? Okay, let's try one more time, Aaron. What about now? Empty? How does this work? Is this a miracle of, of language or something? Okay, one more time. Tell me what the tomb is now. Yes, good job. Thank you for helping us. Now you can go back and have fun. Okay, go ahead, yeah, go have fun. Good, good. Bye. Thanks for helping us. And now that they're gone, I will whisper, I forgot to give them hollow egg, chocolate eggs. But they're at, they're at home for us later. But the tomb is empty. Why? Because the throne is now full. Acts 1 verse 3 says this. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Now, I read that and I think, do the disciples still need proof? For real, right? Do you still need proof that he's alive? He's right in front of you? Hasn't he done enough to prove that he is the son of God? Raising from the dead wasn't enough? His own disciples? I mean, they lived together with him for three years. They ministered together. They saw miracles um, that he performed, like feeding 5,000 people after he realized his sermon was going too long. Still having to prove to them that he was still alive. How much more then might some of us here need to equip us to share the good news of the resurrection of Jesus? Wouldn't it deepen or solidify our faith? Might even deepen our love for him? Some of us like to have 100% proof about something before we believe it. We might say that, but in reality, is that our day-to-day example? Does it reflect that? Did you have 100% proof that you wouldn't get in a car accident on the way here? Or did you have good evidence because maybe your 17-year-old's a good driver and you're coaching them on how to drive to church? Maybe you have trust in yourself as a teacher or them as a driver. But 100% proof? Or did you have 100% proof that breakfast wasn't poison this morning? (laughs) Probably not, but you had good evidence because you probably trusted the people you were with to not poison your breakfast. But you still ate, didn't you? If someone asked you right now, who do you believe Jesus to be How would you answer that? And now why is that so important? Why is it so important that we get that answer right? I'll propose it's because who you believe Jesus to be echoes in eternity where there are only two options. Being with God or without God. 
Now imagine for a moment if someone would snap their finger and all of a sudden every single Bible that has ever existed the last almost 2,000 years would disappear. Would we still have Christianity? Let's snap our finger again and every single writing of Jesus from authors who liked him also disappeared. Would we still have faith? Would Christianity be dead? What we see from history is that Jesus' impact on those who knew him or observed him, heard him teach, resulted almost never in mild approval or mild dislike. Typically, he was either adored or despised. And because there was many who despised him and felt the need to persuade other people to also despise him, they wrote about him. There was over 50 plus writers who were hostile to Jesus who wrote about him poorly. What if just those writings existed? No Bibles, no fans of Jesus, let's say followers of Jesus. Well, when you look at the writings of these 50 plus writers, you can actually start to piece together that their attacks are based on a common set of claims. And these claims actually line up with what we see in the New Testament. With the work of just the hostile writers, we can piece these facts together about Jesus. And I'll read them out because I know you probably won't be able to see the next slide very, very well. From just the hostile writers, the alleged virgin conception, his parents' names, his birthplace, the escape to Egypt, his baptism, his moral character, the identities of his followers and details about their lives, the titles people gave Jesus like Messiah, wise king, savior, his role in judgment, and his promise of eternity, his sermons, his teachings, and claim of deity, his betrayal, trial, accusations of false worship, the timing and manner of his crucifixion, the resulting darkness and earthquake when he died, the early claims and reported appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. We get all that from people who hated him. And we still sometimes don't trust what the people who liked him said. Imagine these ancient writers in their attempt to encourage others to despise Jesus, they actually build a pretty bang on copy of everything the Gospels describe. I actually was listening to a podcast this, this week, and some of you may know the, the name Richard Dawkins. He's one of the more famous uh, atheist scholars and apologists. And uh, this podcast was saying that some people actually become Christians after they read his book, The God Delusion, because it forces them to look deep into the things that he's, he's claiming, right? Someone who is no fan of Jesus, yet God is somehow using even him to bring people to himself. I think that's another miracle. Imagine for a moment, even these writings, hostile writings, were removed. Would Christianity die? The reason I think it would remain is because it's not the New Testament that gave the world the account of the resurrection. Which, the Apostle Paul says, is the sole foundation of our faith. He says, if Christ has not been raised then all our preaching is useless and our faith is useless. It was the true historical event of the resurrection of Jesus that prompted the writings about him that we call the New Testament. And it has been the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised to his believers that gave them the strength to share the news of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus with the world. 
and like I said earlier, in many cases to their death. I don't know many people who die for a lie. Of all the major religions in the world, Christianity is unique for this reason. Christianity is not based on whether or not you can trust one person's revelation that they had on a personal level, happened or not. Christianity is not based on wishful thinking. Christianity began, began because the ministry of Jesus was done in the public eye for three years. So much so that we know it ruffled the feathers of the religious leaders and the political leaders at the time. His teachings were public, his miracles were public, his actions were public, his trial was public, his death was public, and his resurrection was public. Jesus set off a historical bomb that cannot be ignored. And I think it's because of this that there are major religions around the world that have to include Jesus somehow in their framework because you can't ignore this life of this man. The Bible claims that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the one mediator between God and men, the way, the truth, and the life, God's one and only Son, Savior, just to name a few. And what do we hear other messages of Jesus' identity? Islam claims that Jesus was a miracle worker, a good teacher, and a prophet, but not God. Mormonism claims Jesus is the literal son of God, one of the spirit beings that all humans once have been. Jehovah's Witnesses claim that Jesus was an enlightened man. Oh, sorry. What is the Archangel Michael, a minor god, God's first creation? Buddhism claims that Jesus was an enlightened man, not God, a wise teacher. Hinduism believes that Jesus is a God, a good moral teacher, but not someone who actually lived, but an ideal to attain to. Judaism believes that Jesus was a teacher, that God did miracles through him, a good moral teacher, but that he wasn't the foretold Messiah. And New Age believes that Jesus can be just one of many spirit guides. We went through this on one of my Sunday schools a while ago. Who is this Jesus? Often you hear, well, we all worship the same God. But when you look at how people dif differently define this being of Jesus, we can't all be right because we all think he's someone different. So how do we know for sure which one is? How can we be sure we're following the truth about who Jesus is? Have you ever looked into the eyewitness testimonies that we call the Gospels for what Jesus said about himself? Or so far have we just heard what other people in our modern era think about him? Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. And that no man comes to the Father in heaven except through him. We see also in John 8 and John 10, we see two different stories where he was communicating with the Jewish leaders. And he thought of himself as God. And it was clear enough both times in both these stories that he was threatened with stoning, which is the sentence for blasphemy when someone claimed to be God. His hearers knew what he was claiming to be. So how do we know? C.S. Lewis wrote this about Jesus. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, 
You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. Who Jesus is boils down to three real options when you observe the mountain of evidence we have if we are willing to look at it. Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. If Jesus claimed to be God and wasn't, and he knew he wasn't, then he's a liar. And would you call someone a good moral teacher if they're a liar about who they are? I sure wouldn't. If he thought he was God and in reality wasn't, then he was a lunatic. If Jesus claimed to be God and he was telling the truth, then does that make him Lord over all? And it is what we celebrate today, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead that everything hinges upon. I think I said this on Friday. I said, we're not here today unless Sunday's true. When Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection, he told them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. All authority. And this, this next line I'm going to say is something I've been thinking about. One day, we will all bow to Jesus. Whether it is willingly in this life, as Virginia showed us today, or we are forced to when we face judgment. His righteous judgment in the next. Now the gospel a phrase that we've all heard before, it means, does anyone know? Good news, yes, good news. Notice that it doesn't say good advice about what we should do. It's good news, a report of what has already been done for us. When you dive into sorting through all the information about Jesus, and I have books, if anyone here is thinking, I can't get this through my head. Uh, come talk to me, or e actually probably better, because it'll be a busy day after this. Send me an email with the bulletin, I think has the email address. I'd be happy to borrow you some books if you just can't, can't, there's not enough evidence, but. When you read the eyewitness accounts of his life and teachings and begin to discover the love that he has for his creation by revealing who the creator God is. I think we go from, this might be news, to, seems like it's news, to good news, and then into too good to be true news. And don't you feel like when you really have an understanding of really good news, what do you usually feel like doing? sharing that news with others, right? The greater the news, the greater our desire to share that news with others. The greatest mystery, question, and fear in life, I'll propose, is what happens when we die. If it's not now, it will be at some point. The claim of Christianity is also unique in the answer to this question, related to all the other major religions. The salvation of other religions are based on the good or evil works you do, determining what happens to you in the next life. This can make us slaves to everything we do, making us ask the questions, have I done enough good works? 
Or does my works scale tip in the right direction? Am I at 51% good works? Good, then I'll go to heaven. I think God wants us to live free of this burden. And what does our verse here say? Would you all read it with me? If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And I just love that that's a verse that we have up in the sanctuary. God also wants us to be freed from the burden of sin, our own sin. Jesus died for our sins on the cross. And now all who believe and trust in him will be saved. He alone fulfilled the works that were required of us by dying on the cross for our sin. So then when we are judged, we receive grace. The works we do are a result of our thankfulness for this gift. Like baptism. Baptism, the work of baptism doesn't save you. It's you accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior that saves you. You get baptized because you're thankful for that gift of salvation. And we could have a whole other sermon on the thief on the cross, right? But we won't do that today, too. God doesn't want something from us. He simply wants us. Like a father or mother longs for their estranged, estranged child to come back home. God is the parent, having made the path home clear. He simply wants us home. Jesus came to earth as an open invitation for us to come home. Have you accepted this invitation? The place where your soul was created for? Or are you hell-bent on living life on your terms, remaining as the God of your life? Because he is love, you have the free will to choose life with him or without him. Because of his great love for you, he would never force you into his presence for all eternity against your will. Jesus loves you. And his sacrifice on the cross for us was his love letter to us. Have you opened the envelope and read about how much he loves you? Now I think one more thing I'll say before I reread our scripture and, and pray, I guess. You can believe that Jesus is real or even that he is God. But James 2.9 says something very interesting. It says, you say that you have faith for you believe there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How do we make sense of that verse? In scripture, belief, trust, and faith are usually all connected. I think a way to define faith is this. Faith is trusting in what you have good evidence to believe is true. Has your belief that Jesus is God changed to trusting him with your salvation? Trusting in his work on the cross in our place? It's the difference between belief that and belief in. I can believe that a life jacket will save me if I'm stuck in the ocean. But I still don't have to wear it. I have to believe in it and wear it to be saved. I'm going to reread Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 again. But before I do, I'm going to pray. Father, as we uh, read a part of this love letter you've sent to us, 
I pray that where my words fail this morning, that your words will carry on into the hearts and the minds of those who hear them. Sometimes I feel, and maybe some of us here, feel like we always need to talk about Scripture without ever just pausing and listening to what your words have to say right to us. So Holy Spirit, I invite you into this time and this reading to minister in this room and to those online at home that your words and your love for us really impact us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I don't think it'll be at the, at the front. I haven't given them that. But if you have Bibles, open up to Ephesians 2 or your phones. Uh, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of this incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I will end today with the question Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew 16. And your answer to this question is the most important answer in your life. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Open the envelope of the love letter from the creator of the universe. It's time to allow the one who loves you the most into your life. Amen. I invite you to stand up to sing together, God, you're so good. <clears throat> Amazing love that welcomes me, the kindness of mercy.
Thank you for being with us here this morning. My brothers and sisters, may the joy of the resurrection and the hope of Easter fill your hearts and minds this whole year. Come, Lord Jesus, go in peace. Amen.